Section 7.4, reaction yields. So here we're gonna look at what happens where we have a limited quantity of our reactants and we're gonna determine how much product can we make. So I'm gonna draw just a basic analogy here, kind of a, kind of a silly analogy, and I'll draw another one a little bit later. But let's imagine for a minute, let's pretend like we're making just some basic cheese sandwiches. And so we can imagine that you know, we can make one sandwich with two slices of bread and one slice of cheese. So in a way, this is sort of like an air quotes chemical reaction, right? Two slices of bread plus one slice of cheese forms one sandwich. So suppose I gave you 28 slices of bread and I give you 11 slices of cheese and I asked you, well, how many sandwiches can you make? Well, the obvious answer here is, well, 11, right? 11 slices of cheese can be made and then they require 22 slices of bread, which leaves me six slices left over. So we're gonna talk about some terms here called limiting reactant and excess reactant. So in this analogy, the cheeses are the limiting reactant because the slices of cheese runs out first, right? We, that's the first thing we run out of is cheese. And then what do we have left over? We have bread left over. So in this analogy, bread is the excess reactant. So again, the reactant that is used up first is called the limiting reactant. The reactant present in quantities greater than necessary to react with the quantity of the limiting reactant is called the excess, or there could be multiple, are called the excess reactants. Okay, so let's look at a more, a little more scientific example. So here our reaction is H2 plus Cl2 forms 2HCl. So again, this just means one molecule of H2 plus one molecule of Cl2 forms two molecules of HCl. So before the reaction, I've got six molecules of H2 and four molecules of Cl2. So in this example, the Cl2 is the limiting reactant because it's what's gonna get used up first. So four molecules of H2 and four molecules of Cl2 will combine to produce eight molecules of HCl. And once those eight molecules of HCl are made, all of the CO2 is gone, it's all used up. So it is the limiting reactant. And then we would have two molecules of, C, or of H2, excuse me, left over. So H2 here would be the excess reactant. We can also uh, look at, for example, a body plus wheels example when we're making a car. So to be basic here, let's say to make a car, it's one body plus four wheels equals one car. When we take inventory, we find that we have three bodies and 17 wheels. How many cars can we make? Well, obviously we can only make three cars, but which part gets used up first? Well, the bodies get used up first, right? Once we make those three cars, we use all three bodies. We don't have any more bodies remaining. That's used up first, it's all limiting reactant. Which part would be left over? Which part is the excess reactant? It would be the wheels, right? We would use 12 wheels making those three cars, which would leave five wheels left over. So the wheels would be the excess reactants. All right, so let's look at this a little more, uh, let's look at this a little more mathematically, okay? So let's, for example, say that six moles of H2 and four moles of CO2 are mixed together. If all of the H2 reacts, how much HCl can form? So when you're given problems like this, when you're given problems where the numbers aren't so simple and it can't be just analyzed so easily and visually, the easiest way to solve these problems is to take both reactants, or if you have multiple reactants, take all of your reactants and convert them to the same product. Convert them to the same product and then compare how much product can they, can they make. So if all of the H2 reacts here and we assume that we have you know excess Cl2, how much HCl can form? Well, those six moles of H2 can form 12 moles of HCl, which we calculate using those coefficients from the balanced chemical equation as our conversion factor. Now let's look at it the other side. If all of the Cl2 reacts and we assume that we have excess H2, how much HCl can form? Well, again, four moles CO2 times two moles HCl over one mole CO2 forms eight moles of HCl. So the Cl2 can only produce eight moles of HCl, whereas the H2 can produce 12 moles of HCl. So the Cl2 is the limiting reactant and the H2 is the excess reactant. So that means that the theoretical yield here would be eight moles HCl. The theoretical yield is based upon the limiting reactant. So only eight moles of HCl are able to be formed. And then two moles of H2 have no binding partner, so they are left over. That would be your excess reactant remaining. Okay, so let's have you try this knowledge check question. When 21.44 moles of SI reacts with 17.62 moles of N2, what is the limiting reactant and how many moles of SI3N4 are formed?
Okay, correct answer is A. SI is the limiting reactant, and 7.147 moles of SiN3R formed. So you would just convert from 21.44 moles of SI to moles SI3N4 using those coefficients, and then you would also convert from 17.62 moles N2 to moles SI3N4. So you should have found that the SI is capable of producing 7.147 moles of SI3N4, whereas the N2 could form, I believe it's 9.81 moles. Or, yes. Nope, my mental math is off, but it's uh, 8 point, oh, 8.81. There, there we go. Uh, point being is the silicon produces less of that product, so silicon is limited reactant, so this is how many moles of the SI3N4 can be produced. All right, now let's, real, real quick, I want to address choosing which product to compare. Uh, it actually really doesn't matter, right? So if I have a reaction that's AB plus CD, and so I'm given you know the quantities of A and B, and I asked you what the limiting reactant is, it really actually doesn't matter. We could go from moles A to moles C, and moles B to moles C, and then compare results, or we can convert, convert them both to moles D. All that matters is we need to make sure we are converting them to the same product. Now you may, you do want to pay attention here because if I assign you a question that has multiple parts, you may want to use a particular product to save yourself some work later. But just generally speaking, when it comes to determining who the limiting reactant is, it does not matter which product you choose as long as you convert both reactants to the same product. Okay. Now let's talk about comparing amounts of product in grams or moles. Now you can actually do both. You can compare in moles or you can compare in grams. Again, if I just ask you who the limiting reactant is, then you probably just want to convert to moles to save yourself some time. But sometimes it is better to go ahead, go ahead and calculate grams if another part of that question asks for mass. So again, if I just ask you for limiting reactant, you just need to convert to moles and that's a completely valid comparison. But there, if there's a second or third part of the question, you may want to convert to moles to save yourself some time later. Okay, so let's have you try this question. What is the limiting reactant and how much ammonia is formed when 5.65 grams of nitrogen reacts with 1.15 grams of hydrogen? All right, and the correct answer here is B. H2 is the limiting reactant and 6.48 grams of ammonia is produced. So what I would do here is I would start with nitrogen. So I've got 5.65 grams of nitrogen and I'm gonna convert that. I'm going to convert that to ammonia. So I need the molar mass of nitrogen, which is 28.014. Again, sorry about my handwriting. 28.014 grams nitrogen over one mole nitrogen. Now I'm gonna convert from nitrogen to ammonia using these coefficients. So one mole N2 and two moles NH3. And again, final step is I'm gonna to convert to grams since the problem asks about grams. This would be 17.031 grams. So 5.65 5 grams N2, one mole N2, two moles NH3, and 17.031 grams NH3. God, I'm really sorry about this sloppy handwriting. On the bottom, 28.014 grams N2, one mole N2, and one mole NH3. And then I repeat that down below with hydrogen, 1.15 grams of hydrogen. Its molar mass is 2.016. One mole H2, and then on the bottom, three moles H2 for every two moles of NH3, and final step, convert that to grams. And when you do this, you should find that H2 is the limiting reactant and 6.48 grams of NH3 are produced. Okay. Now, let's draw back to that wheels analogy. I asked you how many wheels are left over. So remember, it was 17 wheels at the start, 12 wheels actually used, which means five wheels left over. Okay, so to do that, we could do a stoichiometry problem. We could say three car bodies used times four wheels used over one car body used, which means 12 wheels are used, and then 17 minus 12. So if I ask you how much excess reactant is left over, you wanna take the starting amount 
minus the amount used equal to the amount remaining. And so make sure you, you keep your units consistent. If you're doing it in moles, stick with moles. If you're doing it in grams, stick with grams. All right, let's look at an excess reactant remaining example. An Alka-Seltzer tablet contains 1.700 grams of sodium bicarbonate, which is NaHCO3, and one gram of citric acid, which is H3C6H5O7. Determine for a single tablet dissolved in water, A, which ingredient is the limiting reactant, B, what mass of CO2 forms, and C, what mass of the excess reactant is left over when the reaction is complete. So let's start with A, which reactant is the limiting reactant? I'm gonna take sodium bicarbonate and I'm gonna convert it. So I'm gonna convert it to CO2. So 1.700 grams of sodium bicarbonate, convert it to moles first using the molar mass. Then I'm gonna convert it to moles CO2 using the coefficients from the balanced chemical equation. And finally, I'm gonna convert it to grams CO2 using the molar mass of CO2. And I find that the sodium bicarbonate could produce 0.89057 grams CO2. I'm gonna repeat that process for citric acid. So one gram citric acid, I'm gonna convert it to moles. Then convert from moles citric acid to moles CO2 using those coefficients from the balanced chemical equation. And finally convert to grams CO2 using the molar mass of CO2. And I find that the citric acid could produce 0.68723 grams of CO2. So again, this is a clear example of what I was referencing earlier. The first question A just asks which ingredient is the limiting reactant. So I could have chosen any of the products and I could have just converted to moles to answer A. But I noticed that B asked for what mass of CO2 forms. So to save myself some time, it's much easier to just go ahead and convert both of these to grams CO2 because now we have answered both A and B in one step. We have just determined that citric acid is the limiting reactant and we have also determined that 0 0.676723 grams CO2 would form. Okay, so citric acid is our limiting reactant. This is the mass that forms. Now let's get to that second question. Again, we want to find excess reactant remaining. So sodium carbonate is the excess reactant remaining. So we know how much we, we started with, right? This is the starting mass of sodium bicarbonate. Oops, sorry, my mouse just froze. This is our starting amount. So we need to figure out how many grams of sodium bicarbonate are required. So what I typically like to do, well, there are two different things you could do here. You could use the mass of CO2 and convert back to sodium bicarbonate, or you could use the mass of aluminum reactant and convert to sodium bicarbonate. Either way, you will get the same answer as long as you're doing the math correctly. So let's start with one gram of citric acid. And again, my goal here is to convert two grams sodium bicarbonate. I need to know how many grams are used. So first I'm gonna convert from grams citric acid to moles using its molar mass. Then convert from moles citric acid to moles sodium bicarbonate using these coefficients as my conversion factor. Final step is I'm gonna convert from moles NaHCO3 to grams NaHCO3. And sorry, my slide got a little messed up here. This should be on the top. This bumped this down. Okay, and now we find that we need 1.3118 grams sodium bicarbonate. This is the amount of grams used, or this is the amount required. So now to find excess remaining, I'm gonna take that starting amount. I'm gonna sub subtract the amount used and I get my final answer, 0 0.3882 grams sodium bicarbonate remaining. All right, now let's check. Let's have you try this question. If 15 grams of copper two chloride, which is CuCl2, react with 20 grams of sodium nitrate, how much excess reactant will remain after the reaction is complete? So first you're gonna wanna figure out which one is excess and then determine how much will remain after the reaction is complete. Now the molar mass values are given here. All right, so hopefully you paused that video and gave that one an attempt. The correct answer here is C. 1.04 grams of sodium nitrate remain. Copper chloride was the limiting reactant. Sodium nitrate was excess. You should have gotten 1.04 grams. I don't really have room on this slide to work this problem out, but I'll tell you the steps are exactly the same as the steps we outlined on the previous problem. All right, last thing I wanna mention in this section is percent yield. So I used this word theoretical yield earlier. 
So the theoretical yield is the amount of product that may be produced according to stoichiometry. So when you find the limiting reactant by converting each of the starting materials to grams product, the theoretical yield, excuse me, is the smaller of those two masses. Now, the actual yield is the amount produced in lab. And so those numbers we've been solving for in our stoichiometry problems, those are the theoretical yields because they are assuming that the reactant is converted to the product perfectly with 100% efficiency. But this is not what happens in real life. There's usually, there's human errors, there are other factors like the conditions not being right, there could be potential contamination, the reactants could, and products could potentially leak out, maybe you have trouble isolating the products, so the actual yield is very almost always often less than the theoretical yield. So to calculate the percent yield, this is simply the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100%. Now typically in these types of problems, you will be told what the actual yield is, and you're going to be asked to find the percent yield. So all you need to do is use stoichiometry to find the theoretical yield, and then for find percent yield by dividing actual yield over theoretical yield. So this problem states, upon a reaction of 1.274 grams of copper sulfate with excess zinc metal, 0 0.392 grams of copper metal was obtained. So we've got 1.274 grams copper sulfate, we've got excess zinc, the actual yield is 0 0.392 grams copper. So what we need to do is we need to convert from grams copper sulfate to grams copper. We need to find the theoretical yield of copper based on stoichiometry. So let's walk through that. 1.274 grams copper sulfate multiplied by the molar mass of copper sulfate, one mole copper sulfate over 159.608 grams. Okay, that gives us moles copper sulfate. Then I'm gonna convert from moles copper sulfate to moles copper. It's a one to one ratio. And finally, I'm gonna convert from moles copper to grams using the molar mass of copper. So this gives me a theoretical yield of 0 0.5072 grams copper. So finally, to find the percent yield, you take that actual yield, divide it by the theoretical yield times 100 to put it in a percentage, and the final answer here is 77.3%. All right, one more knowledge check question for you to try. This one states, upon reaction of 15 grams of sodium iodide with excess lead nitrate, six grams of sodium nitrate was obtained according to the equation. What is the percent yield? And the molar masses of sodium iodide and sodium nitrate are given here. Okay, and the final answer is D, 70.5%. So again, I don't really have room on this slide to walk through the steps, but the steps for this problem are essentially identical to the steps to solve the previous problem. Okay, here are four practice problems for you to try. So once again, I do recommend pausing the video and giving these problems an attempt. And once you have done so, on the next slide are the answers. That concludes section 7.4. I'll see you in the next video for the final section of chapter five, 7.5, quantitative chemical analysis.